Okay. Can you see my slides? Yes. Good. Okay. Um, oops, bear with me here. Oops, oops, oops. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you guys for the introduction. I, I'll start out by uh, giving you a little bit of background about myself uh, and then we'll dive into the topic for today. And I have. Um, certainly content for um, for discussing and I have some opportunities for us to work through some of these concepts and some of these theoretical inquiries as a as you know pairs or in in a groups and things like that so that could be intellectually stimulating and not just uh, a talking head um, because that doesn't work for our attention spans very well these days. So uh, let me start out by, by thanking everyone for joining. There's so many people on this call that I'm just happy to see your faces and um, very excited to meet new faces as well. So thank you for, for joining. I'm, I'm greatly appreciative. Um, I see smiling, nodding heads and it makes me very happy. So, um, okay, so my name is Erica Sizek. And I am uh, an assistant professor at the University of Texas at Austin. Um, it's currently 613 here in Austin. It's been a long day of, of teaching. Uh, and so um, at some point, I think my children may, may um, break any of the silence that, that we have during this call. So um, for now, it, it's, it's quiet though. Um, so I am um, at the University of Texas. Um, and my research uh, and my teaching, and I guess all of my um, sort of life commitments really uh, center around social justice and advocacy. So um, I think that's really the locus of what drives me in my work and, and my teaching and my passion. So if it doesn't relate back to that, it, it, it certainly, um, you know, might feel like a, a bit of an outlier uh, for me. So um, today my plan is to talk about a couple areas of theoretical interest. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, intersectionality, uh, sort of building some of the scholarly foundations and, and referencing Natalie's work and Jen Vardaman's work um, as the groundwork, uh, as sort of the foundation building for a lot of the work that um, that I am, am doing. And I, I find it interesting professionally uh, that Natalie now works for the University of Texas. And so I, th I think it's safe to say that we're working on building a critical mass at the university uh, uh, in this area um, of pro-social public relations. And, and so I'm feeling very hopeful despite some of the political climate uh, or a lot of the political climate here in the state of Texas. Um, and I'm happy to talk more about that. Um, where we can uh, really challenge some of that um, um, oppression and, and uh, maybe work to dismantle some of those structural institutional sort of spaces uh, within academia, uh, at least in, in, in our own work. And so, and, per and personally, I've sort of, you know, I've submitted my dossier. And so um, it's in the powers that be. Uh, so I, I'm up for tenure and promotion this year, but that's also given me a, a sense of Mm, freedom uh like okay like i guess i'm gonna cont i'm continuing with my research but i've also like taken a I'm, I'm, i've become quite political and like have gone to the capitol twice already in the past couple weeks uh to just take up space in political legislatures uh you know like in the state of texas where it's a sea of, of white men in blue suits which i have nothing against white men i made one you know my wife and i made a little white man um so like i'm just hoping to sort of uh change some of the toxicity uh and so yeah in my spare time i like to show up at the capitol and take up space and um hold up signs in opposition to some of the bills that are being discussed in, at the legislative sort of uh level so yeah, that I think is that a, is that an adequate uh, introduction as to who I am, and uh, uh, I, feel, I think I'm a pretty good person. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, this is not a dating app, but uh, yeah. I guess so. Any questions about my, you know, my moral compass? Please feel free to drop it in the chat. Um, I teach. Okay, so I teach a law and ethics class. 
and I teach public relations courses. And I just found out I get to teach an honors course that has the same title as this talk today. Uh, I mean, I might tweak it a little bit and make it a bit sexier for, you know, enrollment purposes. But um, yeah, I'm excited uh, to teach a, an honors course uh, that that's going to have a lot to do with this. All right. Um, okay, let me share with you this next little slide because I found this um, and I thought it was very helpful and something you could use in your own pedagogy. Um, but since I'm, I'm talking about um, identity and power, um, this, this gender unicorn, I, I thought was a very nice playful way to um, bridge uh, into what I'm planning on talking about today. Um, and so, uh, yeah, you're, you're welcome to use this um, in your own teaching um, to give us a sense of, uh, oh, sorry, uh, to give us a sense of um, sort of the complexities, right? And um, really my, the, the locus of like what I want to drive home today really has to do with this notion of um, breaking away from binaristic ways of thinking. So moving away from binaries. Um, and I don't just mean that in the sense of like, uh, obviously this graphic here, you know, kind of re graphically represents um, gender and sexuality and attraction and things like that uh, as continua, but uh, building off of the work of, of Lee Edwards and her public relations inquiry piece back in 2012, sort of uh, moving beyond static binary definitions of the field and of theory and of practice to thinking more um, um, along the lines of uh, the fluidity and the kinetic nature of our field, because I think increasingly um, we need to, uh, you know, uh, think in these more complex ways. All right, so good, we're good with that. And forgive me, I think there's like a mosquito flying around here. So uh, if you see me swatting. Okay. Are we good with the gender unicorn? Is everyone is everyone feeling okay with, with that? A little uh, lightness, okay. Uh, please feel free if you have questions um, about any of these things. This is like a learning, uh, li uh, listen and learn or whatever we wanna call it. So if, there, if you're like, I have no idea what that means, please raise your hand and I would love to sort of um, grapple with it. And if I don't know the answer, I can always circle back um, uh, and, and continue. Okay, let's see. All right. Um, so I would like to um, begin sort of the, the larger th theoretical conversation here uh, <clears throat> with taking inventory a bit. Um, sorry, I need to figure out how to change my notes to the next. Okay. All right. So, um, you know, I came of age or whatever that means um, in terms of like my, my doctoral training, um, I guess that would be helpful, right, in terms of understanding lineage, um, which is interesting because like many people on this call somehow have links to Maureen or to, to, to Michael, right? These are like your, um, your doctoral students. And so I guess it's important for me to recognize that my doctoral studies and graduate study lineage can sort of be traced back to um, Pat Curtin at the University of Oregon. She was my doctoral advisor. And so much of what I know and understand about public relations and theory comes from that, that training. Um, and so um, when I think about uh, the history of public relations practice and research, um, it's very much informed by sort of the functional models of public relations and, and paradigms around communication, organizational studies, management studies, right? And it's largely um, building an identity in juxtaposition to that history, right? Um, and, you know, McNamara, he, he notes that PR has been historically nestled within a neoliberal capitalistic um, framework, right? And so, that's why we have these long traditions of, of the sort of dominant paradigm, right? Um, and the, the practice and the theorizing of the fields, you know, in that, in that way. Um, so within that sort of, uh, and I'll just, I don't, I don't, we'll say post positivism that's sort of um, influenced by 
Grunig and, you know, the early folks at Maryland and, and those scholars, right? Um, just to name sort of like locational heritage and lineage kind of tracing back, right? Luke, you're nodding your head and, because you're sort of like a byproduct of like uh, Maryland 2.0 or 3.0, right? Um, and so, you know, all the work I've done has sort of been like against like Maryland 1.0 or, you know, the, not against, but sort of like in, in contrast to. Um, so, you know, if we understand like the emphasis that was historically placed on, um, you know, legitimizing the field on, you know, understanding uh, publics, uh, the advancement of the of organizational goals and, and sort of diagnosing, um, you know, and determining the fields, right? It makes sense. Um, so just sort of laying the groundwork here, like a functionalist tradition really positions public relations as a form of strategic communication, a strategic management, um, that works really like hegemonically uh, to enforce uh, these united concepts uh, of uh, around practice and scholarship. Okay, so what I'm proposing and what I'm talking about today kind of uh, goes, you know, against the grain in that regard. What would be helpful for me? I'm sorry. Um, what would be helpful for me as we move? forward um, is to take a little bit of an inventory here as a group. Um, so I've created this little padlet here and I'm going to drop the link in the chat. Um, it's a very nice little tool I like to use in my online teaching. If you haven't used it before, I highly recommend it. Um, okay, so here I would love for you just to um, log into this little padlet and take inventory uh, for me, if you don't mind, as to, um, you know, where do you personally fit in this, uh, in this history? Where, what are your own um, paradigmatic orientations? Like what level of familiarity might you have around public relations history and some of the, um, um, you know, uh, theoretical, uh, turf wars or I don't know what we want to call them, you know, uh, battles uh, for legitimacy, I think. Um, so I'll give you maybe three or four minutes uh, to do that. Um, and, um, and then I'll sort of review where we all kind of uh, fall on there. Uh, uh, uh. What are Question, we doing to watch that... for there? All I see is uh, is the background on this thing. Sorry. Okay. So when you come to the screen, there's a plus sign at the bottom, and that will give you your little contribution bubble. So this could be this could be like um, text, like folks have written, but you could also take a photo, like you could steal a link or a photo or a YouTube video, anything. I mean, you feel free to use your creative liberties here. Um, if you have like a personal website that has your research trajectory or whatever, um, yeah, feel free to like drop that in. So should we come back after we post? I, I'm unclear on how this works because my other computer 
No, sure. I don't see the Zoom anymore. I'm worried about the recording. I'll call everyone back. Do you see, do you see the Padlet? Okay, and then I'll pull the lecture back up. Okay. Um, thank you guys. Thank you for uh, completing that. I, I appreciate it. Um, so I think, you know, it's interesting. Let me, let me pull this up, um, the Padlet here. I, and if you haven't contributed, please, please do. I encourage you to, because um, it's helpful just to get a sense of, of you know, uh, where we fall um, in the, uh, you know, uh, larger landscape, uh, theoretically and paradigmatically. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I very much appreciate it. And we'll, we'll look a little bit after, after the, the talk. My mouse is going crazy. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to do briefly, um, a little bit of, um, you know, overview of critical, critical theories such that just to lay the foundation for the, the other items I'm gonna talk about. So <clears throat> within sort of the past 30 years or so, um, critical scholars sort of internally to and externally to public relations have really resisted and challenged it challenge this functional history that I, I talked about earlier um, until, you know, the past 30 years, I think, and maybe that's not that long ago, but it, it feels still fairly young and fairly new um, and still a bit on the margins, even though there's um, sort of more traction in critical public relations theory. Um, uh, Sometimes it feels like we're still talking to the same group of folks, though. So I do think there is a spread, but um, you know, uh, as with many things uh, of this nature, right? They, they are non-mainstream, and I, I'm okay with that. I like it that way. I'm not advocating for everyone to be a critical scholar by any means, because then I wouldn't have anything to critique. Um, but um, it's it's important that we sort of think about the tensions that exist. Um, you know. Uh, tensions to draw a professionalism and a scholarly respectability and legitimacy. Uh, and then also, you know, the, the critical perspectives that emerge sort of in contrast to that. Um, you know, in 2002, Elizabeth Toth uh, drew critiques to critical public, public relations. Um, and, you know, we sort of have this um, history where, you know, it's been a bit unwelcome uh, earlier on, you know, uh, and I know she's since uh, shifted her perspective on that, but she asked um, really about the cash value that critical theory brought uh, to the field and to the discipline. Um, and, you know, while that's in 2002, I think it's important that we reflect on that. And, um, you know, one of the points I'll make later on is the, the moment in which queer theory has cash value, it ceases to be queer theory uh, because it, it ceases to engage theoretically, um, you know, with those uh, sort of anti-capitalist or, or um, you know, uh, critical uh, principles. So um, ultimately though, in terms of uh, uh, critical theory, critical approaches really center uh, the role of human agency. Okay, and the importance of context and exploring both culture and discourses. Uh, so it's about humanity, it's about agency, context, culture, and how those are operating 
um, really ultimately the, the, the goal of critical theory driven work and driven projects is this uncovering, right? It's of opening Pandora's box into the um, ideologies of um, these political and economic structures that are governing. Um, so we can look at it at a micro level, at a macro level. Um, and so ultimately it's about re really like revealing um, some of that knowledge, some of those structures that govern the social world um, and also to articulate how they can be changed, right? It's sort of two part, right? It's about sort of like this radical liberation, um, uh, an analytical project of, of radical liberation. Um, I might, let me put the captions back on, sorry about that. Okay. Um, and really, so in sort of the, the product of, uh, of sort of human agency and liberation, um, the idea is that theory can help us uh, as scholars, as, um, as sort of uh, activists in our own spheres to really help uh, sort of the disenfranchise those with less power, regain some of that agency, regain some of that freedom, and to take over their, the production of their own uh, lives and, and, and shared reality. So it doesn't, it doesn't sort of assume that people um, don't have agency. It's sort of uh, looking at the ways in which people also do have agency and, and, and um, um, exert that agency uh, in their lives. All right. So um, I didn't know what the crowd would be today. Um, so I sort of posed this question uh, and I'm, I'm curious, um, you know, at this moment in time, I'd really love to have like a little bit of an open conversation uh, if for those who are willing to chat about like, what role do you see public relations research having in this moment in time? Uh, so yeah, I'll be quiet and I guess I can just, um, uh, pick on people or, or uh, you can raise your hand, but I would love to hear uh, since we have such different um, roots and or, you know, um, you know, beginnings, what, what role do you see it playing right now? Uh, Petra, would you mind um, expanding on that. Uh, thank you. Yeah, um, I know how tough it is to teach actually online. Um, so uh, for me personally, PR research is about challenging the paradigm and challenging the preconceived ideas that people have. You know, there's so many taken for granted ideas, which um, you kind of touched on. But for many of my colleagues, though, it's about improving practice because they're very practice focused. And so there's this constant tension going on. So um, yeah, it, it took me a while. I mean, when I started studying it, I realized functionalism existed and I realized there were different paradigms in it. It took me a while to be honest before I got to that point. And um, I just, I know there's a place for everyone in there, but for me, it's about critical thinking and challenging. Thank you, I, I appreciate that. Um, and I noted in the chat that I would like to think about um, or maybe uh, homework for us to think about as we move forward is like how critical theories can help us or should they uh, help us improve practice? Um, do, do we all have to do all of that? Um, why or why not? Thank you, I appreciate it. I suppose there are two potential outcomes, right? So there's the social, problem side of the research we do and identifying a social problem like focusing on power and lobbying and you know the use of um, you know deep financial pockets to drown out and marginalize certain voices in the public sphere so we can have a social problem focus to our research um, or we could have sort of like the intellectual puzzle side to our research and um, and the intellectual puzzle side I guess is looking to foster best practice through identifying and testing theories and and coming, you know, feeding back into industry that knowledge. Um, so that's that dichotomy. And I think 
as coming new to the field, what I like about the field is that there's so much diversity there that you can just choose the focus that you want to contribute to and, and, and you know, and, and that other scholarship's going on and that can feed into the classroom from your teaching. But my research is sort of focused on the power side of things, the social problem side of things. Thank you, Mitchell. I, I appreciate your articulation of those various contributions. Yeah. Natalie's just gonna do a mic drop here. The purpose of, of the research is transformative change. Can you expand upon, or maybe get, offer some examples of how you see the transformative change? Like, I feel like that could be a really big, bold statement, but also could be empty if we don't um, articulate it or, or hash it out a bit more. Natalie, do you mind? No, and I think I've come to this revelation relatively recently, especially talking about public interest communication and other things like that. Um, uh, it is, for me, I think we have to think more towards action research orientations about actually thinking about transforming the societies we live in, transforming the structures that are in place right now, and using our research, our theories to do that. I And also being reflex, reflective and reflexive in how we're approaching these things. Oftentimes, many of us as scholars don't spend a lot of time thinking about what we do and why we do it and how we do it. So are we really just propping up the status quo? Are we actually just producing articles for the sake of producing articles? Are we being generative with our research? Are we actually connecting with industry and trying to change and shift paradigms there? So for me, I think we have the power to change things if we understand what we're doing. Does that make sense? I'm not, I might be rambling. <laughs> I love that. That's wonderful. And I, I, I don't want to be the one that keeps commenting, but it, it really resonated with me, especially in thinking about like, you know, as you prepare for tenure and promotion, you like kind of look at all these weird data points of your research and you're like, I've spent like an exorbitant amount of time invested in like all of these projects and like it's only reached X amount of people or whatever, right? Like the quantification of like that project. And I'm like, would I be better served like just showing up at the Capitol every Wednesday? Like would my work have more, would my, so my like physical presence have more impact on a global scale or whatever, right? If it were, so yeah, I thank you. I, I appreciate like sort of the larger existential push. Uh, yeah. Well, just to counter that, I think the work that we do, it doesn't mean anything unless we translate it into practice. Translational research is incredibly important, and that's a missing link that we often have a lot of times in public relations, strategic communication, whatever you want to call it, research. We don't translate it so it can be applied and that other people can consume it. I, I think we also, I mean, although I might not admit it on many days, I mean, we have an impact on students. And these are things that take time. You know, when you come to college, you come with all those views you were raised with from your families and your background and what they taught you about, you know, God and the world and all that sort of stuff. And then you start thinking, eh, you know, look at all these other ideas. And I think it just takes time to get exposed to these and get habituated to new ideas. And I really think for the open-minded students, I mean, I get one student at least probably every year who can, you know, parrot back to me the capitalist agenda and basically say that the you know, role of public relations is to you know, help organizations sell stuff and people need to be, you know, buy stuff or the society will collapse. And I don't think those people are ever going to be changed. But the others who are more open-minded, who are like, wow, I never thought of this before. I think it does have an impact. Yeah, I was just going to kind of build on that a little bit and kind of what Erica was saying about submitting your dossier and being reflective on that. But I, I one thing I notice is that we all are playing really important parts. Like we need people who are doing the translational work, but we also need people that are doing the really theoretical work and trying to ask like, you know, more conceptual questions that might be tailored to students or to other academics and not always thinking about how does it translate to industry? Because sometimes I really don't care how it translates to industry. I don't care if an agency uses it because I mean, maybe it won't have that effect immediately. Maybe it'll be a student that, that sees something different or it, it you know, helps us understand the phenomenon more accurately rather than changing practice immediately. I, don't, I think sometimes we're, we're led to believe that because we're situated in professional schools um, whenever maybe that's not always 
what we should be aiming to do? I, I think uh, uh, public relations research should be used to bridge the gap between theory and practice. I was a practitioner for 15 years and, and I, uh, I was quite, quite, quite frustrated when I was working for NGOs because uh, you know, certain practices which are common in, in the corporate world are also quite common in, you know, in international development. So it can make you know, everything very frustrating. So when I joined academia and I joined, you know, I started my research, the first thing I wanted to do was to go back to practitioners and, and you know, discuss uh, what makes the, you know, the experience frustrating and how we should change that. So I, I also learned that you know, uh, scholars are not just, uh, we also have critical practitioners. It's not just scholars who are uh, critical. So we have to learn from them. We have to talk to them and, and we have to you know, build on their frustration to, to improve our research. So that's what I have learned. Thank I you. really appreciate that um, you noted agency, uh, not sorry, practitioners that are doing critical work, uh, critical in such that like pushing boundaries, challenging norms, et cetera, right? Um, and I sort of found like an agency and befriended the owner because I she, she's in Houston. I'm not sure, Terry. So Terry, do you know Black Sheep Agency in Houston? I do know them, but I don't know them well. Okay, so their owner, their leader of the flock is what she calls herself as a University of Texas alum. Um, and it just happens to work perfectly that she's doing this amazing work, but it's all social good work. And so they will, she will only take on clients who are working for social change. Um, and since she and I have become very you know, good friends and I've sort of committed to building a pipeline between the two of us where we do critical work in critical capacity building, right? Um, she worked with Michelle Obama um, in the, a lot of the work um, around college and, and food and literacy and all this kind of stuff. So yeah, I, it's, it's in, incredibly important. Yeah, I'm also really thinking about, you know, when it comes to value, how we really define a, approach, practical value, what is considered as practical. And of course, what Michael said, there will be people who are about making money, raising the bottom line. And that's their maybe virginal approach to this idea of practical value. But also in the same time, I think the beauty of critical theories is about to expose and challenge the social structures that are oppressive to minorities to marginalized populations, and this connected to the value of bringing a social change or needed change. And also with the new younger generations who realize, you know, we, we, as, humanities, uh, we as humanities are facing exist, exist, existential crisis because of climate change. And we, we, we really need to change the fundamental structure of the society, how we operate. I, that's, that's itself is also of immense practical value. So the critical theories can definitely contribute to new ideas and new thinking about how we should do business and what business should be even like um, uh, in today's society and in the future. I think that Erica said it's probably something quite common, but the idea that once this becomes mainstream, it's no longer serving any kind of goal of moving us forward. And um, I've never really considered it that way, but it's true, you know, and once organizations find a way to capitalize on this, then, you know, it, it's not taking us anywhere. It's just going to be an attempt to exploit something that, that is easy that they can do something with. So I think that's the tricky part, too. One of the, I think, frustrations is you, we're always on the cutting edge in these areas. You, we have to keep on top of this. We have to keep ourselves educated. We have to. And it's just a lot of work just keeping up on what's going on and, and learning the vocabulary and learning the language and learning how to talk about it. But what's the alternative? Can, can I say something? Can you hear me, Terry Hemeyer? Yes, you can, Terry. Uh, I, I've got to kind of, which we're all talking about here, what's, what's turned my uh, uh, Apple cart over is two things, warp speed, which has changed everything for us. Everything is so fast. So studying something, uh, how do we 
put in the warp speed part? How do we put in the vehicles that we get to audiences with? When you have a rapper that can get to 200 million people instantly and the media combined goes to 30 million, uh, how do you deal with that? That just happened with Nicki Minaj, where she said something that the president didn't like about the COVID thing. And so, but again, she had an audience of 180 going to 200 million. Uh, how do we deal with that in our communications? We have to. And how do we deal with warp speed? It, 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 we're doing, and yeah, we have, we get a, you give us a, something as a practitioner to work with. We start working with it, but believe me, we're looking for change too. We're trying to, we know it won't last forever. If, if, if a piece of software lasts six months, we're lucky. So I, that's my practitioner view. Yeah, I'm going to talk about rappers in a minute, Terry. I'm not going to talk uh -oh. Nicki Minaj, but I'm going to talk I'm going to talk Lil Nas X if that's okay. And I'm also going to no idea who that is. Oh, you should, <laughs> Terry. We'll talk about it in the office one day. I'll love to go out for a beer with you and, and talk about this because it's uh he's an interesting case. So I'm not, I'm going to talk Dave Chappelle before I talk before I talk Lil Nas X though. Uh, is it okay if we move on a little bit? because uh, I have some contemporary pop culture examples that I'd like to um, uh, to talk about a little bit and think about some of this work within the context of that. Okay, uh, so <clears throat> one thing I want to say as we sort, I'd like to, to finish up that thought around theory and around research and all of that is that <clears throat> This is, this is what I carry with me at all times, is that your theoretical orientation, your paradigm you fall into um, is political. It is your politics, right? Like the feminist movement, uh, you know, the, the personal is political. The paradigmatic is political, okay? It is our praxis. It relates to our uh, personal philosophies and our values, whether or not you recognize it, I recognize it explicitly, right? But uh, your decisions, uh, you know, are, are, are political. Um, so, okay, let's talk a little bit about uh, Dave Chappelle. Uh, and I apologize these examples, and I'm not apologizing, I'm prefacing these examples uh, are uh, US based and sort of like they're pretty recent examples. So uh, I've been trying to think a lot about them in, in my own work. So just to give you a little bit of background of, of the Dave Chappelle case. So um, uh, Netflix uh, issued or, or promoted, well, Netflix worked with Dave Chappelle to produce this this special, um, which is called The Closer. It's a new comedy special. Um, and um, Dave Chappelle is a very prominent uh, comedian in the United States. Um, he has a history of really being a controversial figure. The type of comedy he does is very, um, very aggressive to, to put it lightly. Um, he also has won uh, several awards, including um, the Kennedy Center Mark Twain Prize for American Humor, which is celebrating, which celebrates the role of comedians in American society. Um, okay, so Dave Chappelle has, it's not really about Dave Chappelle though, from a public relations perspective for me, it has to do with a lot of different moving parts, has to do about, uh, has, has a lot to do with Netflix and the promotion of uh, Chappelle in this particular series, uh, this particular special. Um, and then it also has to do with sort of like the internal public relations. Um, and so this, this closer comes out and um, it's full of uh, transphobic, directly transphobic um, content. Dave Chappelle identifies himself as a, a, a TERF, which is a trans exclusionary radical feminist. He um, makes lots of jokes. I mean, there's no sort of like, he's identifying as a, as a, a transphobic individual. Okay, like th that's the sort of pre the context. Um, then we have sort of, okay, so then Netflix invests tons of money into this special. They promote this special. Simultaneously, we have some prominent problems that are happening here, okay? Number one is the suspension of a uh, senior software engineer, Tara Field, uh, who's pictured uh, with the, the glasses and the purple hair. She's a transgender woman um, who slammed Chappelle for his humor about trans people on a, in a viral Twitter feed. She was then suspended, not for her tweets, but instead of what the company but he said she was intruding into an executive's only meeting. 
Um, since then, she's been reinstated um, after the company uh, said, quote, they found no ill intent in her intent attendance to the meeting. Then we have Netflix's chief content officer, Ted Sarandos. Uh, he's sort of uh, igniting further unrest, uh, which uh, on October 11th, he issues a staff memo where he acknowledges uh, Chappelle's provocative language, but he says it didn't cross a line into inciting violence. And I encourage you to look further into this case, but the question really becomes around like creative liberty is what the uh, Netflix is saying early on in this, like a couple of weeks ago, they're saying, well, you know, we're, we're about creative liberty. Um, you know, this, this is, um, you know, this isn't gonna incite any violence. Um, and in reality, we know there are linkages, um, you know, and, and some of my research kind of talks about some of these these media representations like this uh, paradox of, of uh, visibility for certain groups of people with increased media representations and visibility also leads to increased violence against some of the most marginalized groups. Uh, in this case, increased media visibility of transgender people. Um, there are correlations with increased violence against the most marginalized trans people, which include transgender women of color. Okay, so there are you know, correlations that are, are disproving some of these Netflix theories. Um, Netflix says, Sarandos acknowledges, hey, I screwed up. And that's where we are sort of today, October 28th is, uh, is uh, sort of the most recent moment. Um, okay, let's take another public relations. Sorry about that. Okay, this is the letter from the employee resource group, their list of demands. Um, uh, and I'll just read it out loud um, to kind of make space for it. So the employee, the trans employee resource group um, is saying, Okay, sorry, I was just uh, looking at the chat for a second. So the group is saying over the past few weeks, it's become clear there are many places where Netflix still has to grow when it uh, comes to content relating to trans and non-binary community, the trans and non-binary community, the trans employee resource group, which includes trans and non-binary colleagues, allies, uh, wants Netflix to immediately take the steps below to begin to repair the relationship between the company, our colleagues, and our audience. So let's put our public relations, uh, you know, theorist and, and scholar hats on here and, and think about, um, you know, this, this uh, from this perspective here. So they've got content investment um, in their list of demands here. Uh, interestingly, they're not calling for the removal of Dave Chappelle in the, or the, the closer. What they're calling for here is to elevate the um, voices and opportunities available to and the power of uh, trans and non-binary talent Okay, um, so uh, increasing investment, financial investment in, um, in that is comparable to transphobic content, including marketing and promotion, investing in multiple uh, trans creators, uh, revising processes on commissioning and releasing potential harmful content. And then we also have the employee relations component and then harm reduction component. So I think there's lots of really interesting things here uh, for us to explore uh, on a theoretical and research level here. Oh, you wanna come, Natalie wants to come to the little Nas X conversation. Okay. Uh, so what I'd like um, us to do, in, and I'm gonna sort of use my pedagogical tools available to me here, um, is I'm gonna break, or maybe Michael, could you break us into pairs so we can chat a little bit about this? Um, I'd like us to think about ways in which we can develop public relations research um, and questions uh, maybe within the context of this Netflix Dave Chappelle situation that deals with um, structural inequality um, and the integration of critical theory into PR. So the goal here is with your partner to develop a research question that we could use if we were to carry out a hypothetical study, okay? Um, so Michael, would you mind putting us into groups of pairs, please? This is Terry Hemar. Could I not be put in, I've got a plumber and I want a water leak and I'm continually running in and out of this thing. So sure, just, yeah. just observe. <laughs> got it. Sorry. Okay. Michael, you're on mute. I'm saying I can do groups of two to three and I can do, I can track for groups of two. It's not responding, but um, 
I did a second ago, but it won't respond. So let me just, is two or three okay? Groups of two or three? Yeah. Okay. I got to read with myself. Okay.
I'm back. Sorry, I booted myself out by accident. Can we call everyone back? This is an article. Yep, I was just going to ask. I wasn't. And, and I, I put myself you know, into a room with myself and then. Especially <laughs> with the, what's happening here. Especially and Terry, actually. So I had Terry and two of myself in the same room. Oh, so, man. That's a, that's a good conversation. All right, let me end this. Oops, I almost ended the call. When is enough? Um, when are people fed up? When, when does the straw break the camel's back? And breakout it seems rooms. Like Netflix has had a series of rooms. issues with walkouts. Um, and I don't really hear her voice. It's very powerful. It's great. <laughs> Recording in progress. Yeah, I'm not much of a technician. I'm going to have to do two computers again. All right, do we have everybody coming back? I think it should be set. They have a minute or something like that. Okay. Apparently good conversations. Yeah, Shima and I had a great conversation. She developed two strong research questions for studies. Great, ICA is coming up. There you go. This is an incubator for ICA. Let's let's develop a panel out of today's talk. I'm down. I'm in. Where are we going, Paris? Paris. Great. We're gonna read the V the Paris trip. Sounds good. I want to participate. Was that, um, did you find that helpful? Did you have good conversation? Yeah. I heard Natalie um, chatting. Natalie, who were you with? Uh, I was with Mitchell. And Mitchell. Michael briefly. Mitchell yeah. and Michael. Mitchell, would you want it? Would you be willing to share with the, with the group a bit about what you and Natalie discussed? Yeah, sure. So, look, I'm a bit of an outsider to this debate. I'm connected through the Australian comedian Hannah, who got in, who got involved in it as well. Look, I, I, I see this as sort of the tensions in the US with the, the US culture war right now, and so this is the this is the fault lines. Um, and on one hand, um, I think you've got a, a company that knows that it's catering to sort of. Um, uh, uh, prejudices that are still widely head, held in the United States. So they don't necessarily fear a consumer backlash or boycott that might shut them down. Um, so they seem to be willing to hold the line on um, activist pressure groups here to try and sort of say, well, no, this is about, you know, di com comedic diversity and diversity of opinions and free speech. And I think that was what the executive said in response to some of, some of, some of Hannah, Hannah Gasby's uh, criticisms. Um, but I'm afraid that's as far as I got. I, I got to, I thought, what, how does the First Amendment play into this? And how does the argument go forward from there? And the reason where I was going with that, and we sort of got cut off, was that in Australia, we have a um, piece of legislation called a a racial vilification and discrimination act. Now it's not about gender, but it basically means you can't be, you can't say anything racist in Australia or you will be in trouble, but you don't have something similar in the United States where you have a, have a piece of legislation that would inhibit that speech. Um, so maybe that's the end point of the overall conversation about how do you stop this thing happening in the future is some sort of federal act, um, but yeah, that's as far as my thinking got on it. But Natalie had some much better ideas and some and more focused questions. So I'll stop talking and hand it over. Well, you know, you did a great job, Mitchell. And you, for an outsider, you did a great job. So I think one thing I was thinking about was this wave of tech activism, which also plays into the labor walkouts, the labor strikes that the U.S. is experiencing um, across different economies and different sectors. But I think that plays a lot into this as well, thinking about if the only thing that you can do is move your body and raise your voice, how does that work inside the organization? Because if we think about not just the Chappelle thing, but also too, they fired what, the Black pregnant woman who was leading this. They, buy, they put other people on um, 
on suspension, other things like this. So I think this is more a deeper issue of worker rights, labor communications, when an insider, when your internal public now becomes an activist and your internal public now becomes an external public because they're so mad at the decisions that you're doing, what do you do and how do you deal with that? And how does the company respond? The company only cares about money. I think Michael made that point. They care about money because people are watching it. But what does that do when you've eroded all your trust with these people that are supposed to be your loyal employees? I love that. That's like, let's make a paper out of that. Like I'm incredibly interested in, in this labor as well. Right. Um, yeah. Other, other one, how about one other pair? I would love to hear from, um, did anyone, was anyone particularly compelled by their conversation? Just one more small group and that would be, that'd be great. Uh, so the other Erica and I, we, we talked about um, what, what, what happened before they released um, the, um, the special. And we, we were wondering about uh, there should be a, a several decision that was made before they released it to the public. And there should be somebody who uh, voiced their uh, protest against, uh, you know, the special and what decision making process that were made and what public relations uh, plays into that. And I think if we have some archive, uh, you know, from a very research method, Dodgeco, you know, that approach, if we can have the archive, we have the internal emails and we can see how the power dynamic plays out before they released it to the public. And I think that's a very interesting research question if we have the, you know, the data to look so at it. You, um, just so I can clarify, do you mean um, the decisions to fund the, the special? Yes, and also um, before the, all the promotion that started, I think, uh, for example, if I'm the um, PR person, the marketing person, we will see the special before we do the promotion. And when people receive that material, when they watch it, I think there should be some employees who were concerned uh, about the content and how they voiced uh, their their concern in the in Netflix and how that. Um, concern were addressed in Netflix. So it's kind of like the uh, intersection between critical studies, but also some like internal communication. Yeah. I think that would be fascinating. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I'm sorry, Alvin, who did you work with? Uh, the other Erica. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, Erica, was there something you'd like to add? Yeah, I mean, he really hit the, hit the nail on the head with that, but I, um, also as a person who loves to study like crisis responsibility and understanding, like I wasn't familiar with who was the content producer, like was it a Netflix production or was it a, um, was it something that like he, Dave Chappelle himself was in charge of and kind of how that resulted in like media portrayals of like who's to blame for the situation? Is it something that Netflix takes ownership over or is it something that they just facilitated or kind of what's their role in responding? And is there an obligation to respond to different extents or degrees based on um, how they enable that to actually air and run? Great, thank you. I realize this time is going by much faster than I had anticipated. So I have tons more content, but this is very fruitful and I, I think um, much more productive than just walk, talking through you know, ideas or concepts. But can I um, shift gears briefly just to talk about another, because I said I was gonna talk about Little Nas X and I, I, I still want to, but I need to uh, build some of that theoretical foundation for us before I do that. So let me talk a little bit about querying public relations. Um, and um, I think maybe this is like the, the stake I'm making in the field or the, the area I'm trying to build is um, sort of um, thinking about um, rethinking identities and knowledge production and, and um, sources and politics that define PR historically. Um, and so, Let's talk a little bit about like some of the epistemological challenges. I think Kate Fitch um, had asked me to talk about this, so I'm, I'm 
I'm saddened that she's not here, but maybe she'll she'll watch um, the presentation. So <clears throat> when thinking about so. Um, you're welcome to read the 2018 Journal of Public Relations research article and, and uh, argue with me on Twitter or ask, you know, whatever we'd like to do to <laughs> uh, debate that. But, um, you know, the, the, the statement I made earlier about theory and, and when it ceases to do what it's supposed to do really is grounded in um, a sociologist um, understanding of queer theory. And I, I believe it's... I'm not going to say who it is because I, I don't remember off the top of my head because um, I don't want to get it wrong. But um, when what's the value of, of queer theory? There's an article I can share with you. And I think that's the question we can ask ourselves of, of many critical theories. But when queer theory um, becomes an object of capitalism, it fails to be queer, right? And so it's not just about like, um, it's really an analytical project. It's not about like recognizing um, or interviewing or sampling uh, LGBTQ lives. It's much more about a problem, a project of problematizing and, and um, about um, challenging, uh, disrupting, uh, making sort of trouble. Uh, that's really what it's about, okay? So it's about uh, disrupting some of those restrictions that are associated with binaries and binaristic thinking. Um, and that's in contrast to um, like intersectional theory, which involves really a examination of social identities, right? So it, with intersectionality, we look at the ways in which maybe race, sexuality, gender, all of those are uh, implicated in the intersections to understand power relations. Um, both projects are involved with um, sort of uh, critique, but they're different in their histories and their roots, and, and they all have their own legacies and predecessors and philosophical underpinnings. So I, I sort of want to make that clear as well. Um, I'm going to briefly talk a little bit more about queer theory, and then I'm going to ask you to think about it within the context of, of Lil Nas X. Um, okay, so when I when I talk about queer theory and queering public relations, it's really about um, attending to some of the systemic components that include history and context and really to examine um, some of these manifestations of power uh, that have been determined by binaries and categories. The easiest one for us to think about has to do with gender, right? How has the um, manifestation of gender as binary um, uh, like what, how is, what are those manifestations look like? Well, we have, um, you know, power and privilege around masculinity and, and, you know, white masculinity and all of that. So, you know, um, queer theory asks us to trouble those binaries. Okay. Uh, I'm not going to be able to go into all of this. Um, so let me, um, talk a little bit about an analytical tool that I have used, um, and this is called a queer of color critique. And I think of this as a um, combination or like a unification of intersectionality and queer theory. So again, I don't have very much time to go into all the history of this, but just sort of know that historically, um, um, the perspectives and lives of people of color have not been included in the history of queer theory. And in critical race theory, uh, the history and lives and experiences of non heterosexual and non cisgender people have not been included in those histories. Okay, so this brings sort of those erasures to the forefront um, and is an analytical tool for kind of looking at um, um, uh, erasures and structural sort of inequity. So queer of color critique comes out in the late 1990s out of a climate that really was characterized by these exclusions that I've, I've um, articulated here, okay? Um, it comes out as like a critical departure of queer studies um, on the tales of sort of women of color feminist, anti-racist criticisms, et cetera. Um, and it's a response to like the whiteness of queer theory and the whiteness of uh, queer activism at the time, okay? Um, it really directly confronts some of these limitations um, that, that scholars have, um, you know, uh, and activists have drawn our attention to. Okay, so, Within public relations, um, I'm, I'm suggesting that, you know, if we uh, take this approach, um, we can disrupt some of this 
um, knowledge production that has happened in public relations that has contributed, that has caused public relations to contribute to some of the racism, some of the uh, heterosexism, some of those isms, um, and really um, by calling into question some of the implicit whiteness, some of the implicit heteronormativity that have guided our, our discipline, our field, our research. Okay, and I'm um, challenging some of those master narratives um, that exist inside and outside of, of public relations. Okay, so that's where uh, it leads us to uh, my favorite character of the day, uh, Little Nas X. Um, so uh, just by a show of Zoom hands, um, how many of you are familiar with uh, Little Nas X? Okay, Erica's clapping. I see people smiling, but uh, um, do you know who I'm talking about? Yes, yes, no. Who doesn't? Michael doesn't know. Who else doesn't know? Okay, Mitch, Mitchell doesn't know. Okay, so I'll give you a Okay, so a, a Lil Nas X is an American uh, rap pop star. Okay, he is openly gay and he is a black man. In the United States, black masculinity is often um, uh, seen as incompatible with uh, sort of queer identities, historically speaking. And so this makes it a very powerful, he's very powerful in this particular historical moment in time in the United States because he is incredibly provocative. He is incredible. But I think that's enough to say. Please look at his um, music videos, um, Montero, um, all of them really, I can drop some links, but they're incredibly provocative, um, not just in like uh, from the perspective of sexuality, but because of the tropes he draws upon, right? Montero is bringing in religious imagery. Um, he is giving the devil a lap dance. I mean, like it's like incredibly sort of, uh, powerful in, in this way. Okay, and so he's he also has taken on a new role at Taco Bell, which is an American fast food chain. I'm not sure if you're familiar with Taco Bell. Yes, Taco Bell. Do you know Taco Bell? Okay, all right. Um, and so the interesting detail about Little Nas X is that before he became a, um, uh, an American pop uh, icon, he worked at Taco Bell. Um, and so that was his first job as a teenager. And so now Taco Bell has taken him on as their chief impact officer, which is an honorary title that allows them to team up uh, on exclusive experiences uh, around this new album of his. So it was a 60 day partnership between uh, Lil Nas X and Taco Bell. And so it's just a fascinating, I think, um, you know, case study to think about celebrity fandom, um, corporate engagement with, you know, advocacy. I mean, there's so much here. Um, and also um, Nike, he created this shoe that supposedly had blood in it. You're welcome to sort of look at it, but all sorts of really interesting things on the heels of, of, of queer theory and an intersectionality that we could kind of uh, play with in, in more depth here. Um, my child is slipping notes under the door here. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I encourage you to, to look further into this. So let me um, sort of conclude um, with thinking about some maybe future directions for us here um, and thinking about where this might leave us as scholars, as activists and as practitioners um, of, of social uh, good in public relations. Um, so I think this leaves some areas of agency and power and resistance and dissensus. These are all sort of things that, um, you know, are keeping me up at night. I think it's important that we attend to how certain identities and certain lives matter um, in moments in time in terms of history and the role of public relations in making them matter or in um, silencing or uh, further mar marginalizing some of the, the voices um, where some voices are relegated uh, further to the margins. So um, asking ourselves, where are the voices of certain groups? Um, where are those silences and, and paying attention to those, um, those historic uh, you know, uh, silences? So I will sort of lead, leave with that. Um, um, yeah, and happy to continue conversations, dialogues. Uh, if you want to put a panel proposal together for ICA, I'm happy to be part of that. Uh, whatever you want to do, let me let me know. But um, I'm thankful that you you stuck around and that you engaged. And I'm very uh, happy to be asked by Michael to, to be part of this. So thank you guys. Uh, much appreciated. Thank you, Erica.
reaction. Questions? Anybody want to jump in, follow up on something? No, usually we have Kim here and Kim waits to like the very end and then asks her one question, like she's getting credit I, for it. I could give you a good, good one, but it's not mine. And it's a troublemaker question and it comes from Bruni uh, and um, the big man in, himself. Uh, and it's from the, I was at the ICA in Washington DC on that session that uh, Maureen, you were there and Bruni was sitting next to you. And right at the very end of that panel, it started to get interesting because he said, yeah, critical theory, it's all well and good, but what can we do with it? What can we teach our students? What can our, what can we, you know, that connection between, I guess, um, you know, theory and getting them to, to work in the workplace there. So if you were at that session, what would you have said in response to Grunig? Uh, what can, what do we want our students to take away from uh, critical theory and uh, intersectionality, intersectionality um, and so that it makes, so that it can bring that knowledge into an agency. Yeah. What do you think? What do I think? Uh, Natalie <laughs> commented that Grunig has been asking this question for years. Uh, I don't feel, <laughs> I don't feel like I had to, you know, honestly, I have come to a point, there is a critical enough mass of uh, individuals who see the value of this critical think. It's an exercise in critical thinking. It's about asking hard questions. Not all that we do has to somehow solve industry problems directly, right? Um, I think Natalie nailed it when, when she was talking about translating our research. I think um, the challenge for us is about translating our research to um, explain why our findings are, are, or our analyses matter, right? Um, and so that's my answer for, for critical theories because I'm asking hard questions to bring to light inequities or power, you know, like what happens when, you know, we have a dominant narrative for 50 years or thing like that. Yeah, Petra, mm -hmm. we don't have to solve all the practical problems. You know, I have, I have scholar friends who are working with industry directly. That's th those are their contributions, right? My contributions can be different. Thank you. There's a theory uh, towards the end. The implementation to me, as a practitioner, I need to know how to implement the theory or figure out how to do that or think about it. Is that part of what you do too? Um, my theory. It's not so much about applicate. So my, my theory isn't intended to solve industry problems. It's to bring to light industry problems. Does that make sense? To poke holes, I poke holes. And then I, hand, I can hand it over to someone else who can find um, you know, a theoretical model to, to make the, um, to fix things. I'm a, I'm, I'm a shit stirrer. Does that make sense? A shit starter. Yeah, but you got to have the person that cleans up the shit. That's that's true. Absolutely, and, we work in conjunction, right? And that's. Go ahead. Well, actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to disagree with that. This idea that like our job is to feed industry people and that, that they complain that we aren't training students well enough to do their jobs for them. And, you know, my, one of my close friends was an accountant. And the first thing that the, the, the major accounting firm did um, it was Deloitte, I think at the time, Deloitte, before they'd merged five other times, was brought them all in to learn how to write and did a seminar to teach them how to write reports and how to be better writers. So this idea that our job is to meet industry, I think, is a mistake. And when I was at OU, about, you know, same time Natalie was there, we used to have these ad people come in, you know, once a, once a month to do this dream course lectures. And at the end of it, I think all the PR people, at least we did, we'd yawn and we'd say, okay, we could have told you this 10 years ago. You know, you just discovered this is the most important thing. You know, relationships are important. So I actually disagree. I think industry needs to get off their ass and get out there and realize that they have a role to play in learning about it and learning about it instead of expecting us to do it for them and hand it to them and tell them how to use it. What if we, what if we pay you for it? I'm being facetious, but if we, if we don't have time and I don't have staff, what if we have some money and we ask you to help us? 
Yeah. Well, I'll tell you honestly, I, I said that a decade ago is that you should pay somebody for it. You should stop expecting people to give it to you for free because I think it's a valuable asset that organizations understand these things. So to be honest, I have no problem with that. I'm not, I don't think it's, it's a sellout, but I just think the idea that like, how can we, you know, let's give it to us, give it to us so we can use it and how can we apply it? You pay everybody else when you want something. So pay somebody for that information. I totally think that's great. I agree a hundred percent. I just want to read Petra's comment because I think that a lot of people have agreed and she didn't vocalize it, but she said, we don't have to solve all practical problems. Sometimes our thinking can open the paths for others to solve the problems, right, Terry? So our, our thinking opens paths um, and it's, yeah. You, you, you open paths of things that we've never thought of and that's great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's and great. I don't know, I don't know if we have the capacity, like I, I, I would feel exhausted it, I don't have the uh, bandwidth, maybe I should say, to open paths and then blaze the paths. Does that make sense? Like, yes. It, um, if our colleagues who do other forms of research are committed to some of the same causes that we are, if we are advancing social change and whatever, well, you can help me by doing that then, right? Like we can work in tandem um, to, yeah. Another answer could be um, that um, the scholarship has expanded the concept of a, a PR practitioner or PR professional. For example, I'm working on activist groups, although they are not considered as PR practitioners in the PR industry, but they are practicing PR. They are, they are doing public speaking. They, they are doing community organizing, they, they organize meetings, they raise awareness about their social justice issue. So what I am working on does not fit into the PR industry, but fits into how those activists use public relations. Can I say something maybe controversial too? <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Oh, uh, yes. I just, again, this is a theory. I've studied it for years. Uh, why are there's a significant amount of senior public relations people running major organizations that don't have a public relations background? Uh, I maintain, and I'm writing about it now, we don't grow our own. We don't, and, and we don't have the bandwidth with the people as we that we bring up through the ranks. And so you have a ton of people. I used to belong to the PR seminar, the 100 top supposedly PR people in the world with the major agencies, 70% of them had, didn't have a PR background. That creates an issue of what their background is and where they come from, and they don't have any, any kind of a, a groundwork of public relations and what we're all about. Uh, they're put there for a reason because the company couldn't find the right person in PR because they weren't uh, broad enough and didn't have the experience. I mean, that's my view. I've, I've lived it for 50 years and I've solved it myself, but I, I'm trying to solve it for everybody else. I took my people, not my people, I took the people at the company I went to out of uh, the energy company and I moved them around every year into different jobs. It freaked them out. But guess what? At the end of five years, they were all pretty qualified to take my job. And um, that's what I, I, I wanted more of. I think though we could argue that the idea of white privilege um, actually disproves this point. Like, why is it that, and, and the number of women, the small number of women in management and public relations, when the majority of the people entering are women and the majority of people in management aren't women, isn't simply because they're not qualified to take those jobs. Um, and so I think there is something more going on than just a matter of, we don't have the people in place to put in those jobs. I think there's a little more than that. Well, I, 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 and I say the, the senior management doesn't have all the facts and doesn't know, and they're making these decisions based. I agree with you on that, but I think that uh, it, it's not that they're not qualified, maybe, but but if they haven't done some of these things, uh, they, they need to do them and, and be well-rounded as they come up. Well, some of the people that could be CEOs were pushed out 
of the pipeline because they were women or because they were people of color or LGBTQ disabled, whatever. There's also the issue of the glass escalator that allows underqualified men, especially white men to move into feminized positions at a higher rate. So all of that going together with the fact that we're cap, these are capitalistic businesses and they're looking for business people to lead, not communicators to lead, all contributes to that. Yes, I, that, that's a good point, good point. First thing I did was take as many courses as I could in business. And that's why we have a, a minor in business at UT to give everybody the language to kind of deal with that. Can I just add one, one thing about diversity and inclusion is um, the biggest issue that we found was uh, occupational fit. And um, when you look around in public relations industry and you see people that are not like you, that don't look like you, that don't hold the same values as you, you're not going to join the industry. And that's actually a major problem in the public relations industry. So up until end of last year, we actually were working with practice to try and change that. I mean, our course initially was very white female oriented and we now have a lot more diversity in there because there's a push in New Zealand for um, ethnic diversity. And um, I have to say that over the years I've seen some change, but it's a slow change. They have to start seeing people around themselves who are like them. And so it's, it's you know, we, we, when it comes to practical change, you can, we can say as much as we want, but people have to feel comfortable. There needs to be a cultural shift in the industry itself. Mm -hmm. I think Natalie's point um, in the comments is uh, a super important one, right? If we're only, if we're conceptualizing public relations as sort of like agency work, right? Um, mm -hmm. Then sure it's super white or whatever, right? It's super hegemonic, right? Um, but if we, if we redefine public relations in ways that some of the critical scholars have, well, shit, right? All of a sudden, like a lot more people are practitioners and a lot more people are engaging in, in, in doing public relations, right? Um, and that's, very, I mean, yeah. Go ahead. Well, Shima very, and I were talking about her work as, uh, yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, the majority of the people aren't in agencies anyway, which is something I. That's right. Yeah, you know, I have That's a colleague right. who's teaching the intro PR ad class, and it's all agency, agency, agency. And I spend my time in, you know, my sessions. He's teaching the you know mass lecture saying this is not you know, like yeah i know that's what peter's teaching you but we do a lot more than that you know we operate at corporate levels we operate operate in hospitals and nonprofits and educational institutions and activism and so it is true it's, um you know this focus on agencies is also sort of illusory i agree i also think there is like a danger of sort of portraying PR as just one way, because if we only talk about PRs in the industry setting, then going back to what Natalie mentioned about how we can, a lot of people doing PR work, but sometimes because if we overemphasize that side of PR, people will be hesitant to also identify themselves as PR practitioners because of this, I guess, stereotypical notion of what publishers really is. So I guess that's got also going to be a problem if we only emphasize PR in this particular or in that particular way. The other issue we have, and, and Natalie and, and Eric have heard me say this, we have a, our titles. A PR is an agency word. In government, it's public affairs, uh, you know, and then there's corporate communications and companies. That's what PR is called. So we're named different things in these different entities where more people work than in agencies. I have a slightly different directional question, if that's all right with everybody. I'm, yeah, I'm curious, please. you know, hearing about uh, uh, Erica's work building up this idea of queer theory and PR, connecting with uh, Natalie and Jen Vardaman's work in intersectionality what's next you know what do you want to see you know those of us who are you know the junior faculty now diving into what do you want to see grad students 
tackling to help continue to push and expand uh, the, the groundwork that you've laid? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think we haven't even begun to scratch the surface when it comes to um, so like social class. Um, I'd really like to uh, to think more about poverty. I'd like to and like I think Katie Place uh, has started sort of that some of that work around like uh, you know economic socioeconomics. Um, so that's one area. Gosh, yeah. I mean, I need to think more about that. I, I yeah. I don't know if I have an easy answer or a quick one for that. So like, what's the next era? I'm not done with my era. Don't kick me out. <laughs> Love really. um, well, I hate, I, you know, I hate to use Kuhn and like that paradigmatic universe, but in a sense, I feel like there's a lot of normal science that still needs to be done around queer theory. Right, like there's a not there's a lot of applying that to a lot of areas, um, seeing how it interacts with a lot of our other theories, um, mm. and and again, I think the the other I I absolutely agree with you that that sort of expanding out from an intersectional point of view is really an important place to start, right? Whether that's um, socioeconomic issues, whether that's ability disability, um, you know, whether that's uh, uh, I, I mean, there's a you know plethora of different identities that we can can start from from that perspective. But I hope that there are places where we can can take the work that you and others have done in this area and start to say, how does it impact a lot of other pieces of our PR universe? Right, that interaction. Um, yeah. You know, we haven't brought that into crisis communication as much, right? We haven't brought that into um, you know the disaster communication work that. Brooke Lou and others, others have done, right? So there are a lot of places where this can, can hopefully move outward, I, I hope. Um, yeah. yeah, there's my, there's my, my book project for uh, going toward full professor. How's that sound? <laughs> no, you know what, you, it made me, Luke, your question made me think about a, a review or comment that I recently got. And um, my, my, co-authors and I are sort of making a particular argument and the reviewer wants me to make a very different argument, uh, which is fine, right? Like I totally get it. But this reviewer was really um, asking us to think about the larger environmental crisis um, and to think about the role of public relations. And I think this is very valid. It's just not what we're doing in the paper. Um, the role decentering humanity like decentering the human to recognize all the other components that um, um, contribute to environmental, like to the environmental degradation, really, right? It's about like, okay, how about everyone else we should be, everything else we should be paying attention to? Like humans, you've been really, you've been really um, selfish for the past however long, like <laughs> what else, like let's decenter humans for a moment. So, um, I think it's a really interesting direction. And a book just came out, uh, came out by uh, Munshi and Kurian um, about that. So I recommend you read it. It's a, I don't know if I have it right here. Um, oh, yes, I do. It's uh, Public Relations and Sustainable Citizenship uh, Representing the under, Unrepresented by uh, Munshi and Kurian. Uh, it's, uh, yeah. It's a very provocative read, and I encourage you to sit with that maybe as the next chapter of these dialogues. <laughs> so, yeah. I think your kitty's trying to read it. My kitty's trying to read it. It's true. She's like, I've had enough of you talking. Okay, should we? Uh, I, I, don't, I don't like to wrap it up prematurely, but if um, I, I actually am being forced. I'm doing a face-to-face -face test with my students and uh, I had to schedule some for Friday. So I've got to now do an exam with a student in a few minutes. No yeah. worries. I have to help put my kids to bed. There's, they're slipping notes under uh, the door. So I do have to take on my next job, uh, parenting 2.0. So uh, it was a pleasure uh, chatting with everyone. And I do hope something comes of this uh, by way of ICA, please. Uh, I'd love to continue the conversation and continue theory building and uh, all of this good work. Excellent. Well, thank you for coming.
Thank you very much. It was really interesting. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Eric. That's great. Here we go. And did you get my picture? Where is it? I just sent you a picture of your phone of my of, uh, Alita. Oh. All right, everybody. I was nice seeing I didn't you. Didn't get it. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll try to send it. By email. Yeah. I don't know. Sometimes yours don't come through until like it's like a text message. I used to text, but a uh, uh, Peggy. What kind of phone? You have an iPhone, right? Yeah. Oh, it should work. Peggy had a Android and used to not be able to get messages till she uh, did some sort of mumbo jumbo with programming. But I've got a picture yeah. from Paris I sent you, and we've got messages we've exchanged. I don't know. I'll send it to you by email. Um, yeah. So this was good. I like Erica a lot. Just a second. Let me stop recording this. Uh,